Should I avoid fluoride toothpaste? What are the risks and benefits? In summary, if you have long COVID, why are peanut allergies so common these days? So that's nearly a five times rise and increase in tree nut allergies and just allergies in general. So we all have parasites in our body right now. All of us have candida. By the way, the greatest carrier of parasites by far of any meal you could eat would be if you consume pork. Hey everyone, Dr. Josh Axe here. Welcome to the Growth Lab podcast, where each and every week I cover the science behind how to grow, including yourself, your health, your wealth, and take your career, your relationships, and your spiritual well-being to the next level. On today's episode, I'm going to be answering numerous health questions and everything from how to cleanse your body of parasites to what sort of toothpaste should you use and a whole lot more. First question here is regarding toothpaste. Should I avoid fluoride toothpaste? What are the risks and benefits for oral health? Well, one, I'll say that I have not used toothpaste with fluoride in it since college. So that's over 20 some years ago. And I started learning about and doing a lot of research on fluoride toxicity and started finding fluoride is not only in a lot of toothpaste brands, it's also in our water supply, along with a lot of chlorine, and too much fluoride over time will accumulate in your tissues and cause toxicity in certain organs, such as your kidneys, your liver, and your brain. And think about it like this, it is a metal, it is a uh, mineral that like lead or mercury can accumulate. Now listen, fluoride is not as toxic as lead or mercury, but it still is toxic in too high of doses over time. And it's really not needed. You know, when we went, go back and look at why people's teeth decay, it's not a lack of fluoride. It actually tends to be a lack of fat soluble vitamins like vitamin D, vitamin K, and vitamin A. Weston A. Price a very well-known dentist for many years ago went and studied tribes of, of uh, uh, tribal people. And he found that some of these tribes had incredible oral health and he found their diets played a huge role in that. And so I do think brushing your teeth is important, but I actually think the food you eat on a regular basis, lots of vegetables, some fruit, some meat, and getting some healthy fats in your diet is even more important. And so when it comes to toothpaste, I would go fluoride free. I would look for a toothpaste that has things like baking soda in it, coconut oil, bentonite clay, activated charcoal, certain minerals like calcium in there as well can be great, and even probiotics in a toothpaste, uh, and certain herbs uh, using essential oils. So those are some of the common ingredients I would look for in your toothpaste. Now listen, there may be a, study, a few studies that show that fluoride can help with tooth decay, but there are also side effects with that versus there are other nutrients that I mentioned that also help with tooth decay that don't have those side effects. I'd also mention that I think not only should you brush, I think that flossing or instead, if you'd rather oil pull where you swish around coconut oil in your mouth for five minutes has been shown in clinical studies to have benefits for preventing gum disease. So I like those habits better than fluoride toothpaste. Second question, is chiropractic care beneficial? I've heard some differing opinions. Yes, I believe chiropractic care is incredibly beneficial. Now, I want to say this. I think it depends on the chiropractor you see. You know, you could go in today to see a medical doctor, and you're going to have some incredible medical doctors that practice more functional medicine, integrative medicine. They try and get to the root cause. They're prescribing vitamins and minerals and diet and reducing stress. But then you have some that are just pill pushers and, and don't even look at your patient history. So I think chiropractic can be a similar thing. You've got some really talented and skilled chiropractics from, from and I I know some groups like PX Docs and Maximize Living and some other groups uh, where, where the chiropractors uh, practice in a very specific way that I think is extremely beneficial. Now, here's the, re the way that chiropractic works is that you have uh, a bunch of vertebra that surround your spinal cord. And you have a you have your skull, which surrounds your brain. And your brain sends signals to your organs. So your brain sends signals from your brain down your spinal cord, out your spinal nerves, out to every cell, organ, and tissue in your body. So for your heart to beat, for your lungs to breathe, for your stomach to digest food, you have to have signals go from your brain, out your nerves, to your organs. What can happen is chiropractic 
chiropractors go if they're practicing uh, this the, the, the way that they should. They're going to go and look for impingements or lack of mobility in vertebra that can be affecting nerves or nerve, nerve signals getting from a brain to an organ. And so what, what they're going to do is they're going to go, and, and here's what happens is if you have an area of the body where there's not a lot of movement, where it's kind of stuck, well, it's, you're not going to get enough blood flow there. You're not going to get enough nutrients there. And that's going to affect this, the health of the tissues. Uh, you know, if you don't, um, if you don't ever move your knees and you just left, left in a cast for five years, it's going to cause uh, deterioration and malfunction of that area. So what chiropractors do is they go and improve mobility in those areas that allows more blood flu flow and nu nutrients to get to the area, which then actually helps nerve and neurological health, which can actually help organs function better. So chiropractic care, I think primarily people think of it as getting rid of back and neck pain. And it is great for that because it's restoring proper function to an area, but it also in, in studies has shown to help kids with ear infections. It's been shown to help with acid reflux in adults and colic in children. It's been shown with certain types of chiropractors to help scoliosis. Uh, it's also been shown uh, for sports performance. In fact, a lot of professional sports teams, uh, NFL teams, Pro golfers have chiropractors on staff. And so there are a lot of benefits, migraine headaches, it's been shown to be beneficial for. So overall, I'm a big chiropractic fan and, and I get adjusted regularly. And so I do think that chiropractic does have some tremendous benefits in terms of it helping optimize the body's ability to function properly and neurologically. Next question, are there any natural remedies to aid in the healing of long COVID? There are. Now, when you look at the, uh, the, the Chinese medicine perspective, which I think is a really good perspective at long COVID, what you'll see is they tend to, they tend to see there's blood stagnation. So you have blood that's kind of getting sticky and it's not moving through the body properly. And your blood, if your blood isn't healthy, that can affect a number of things, such as your cardiovascular health, right? We're seeing with long COVID, oftentimes it affecting heart health. We're seeing it affect lung health. So that's the primary thing people are experiencing with long COVID is cardiovascular systems like fatigue is a major symptom. Now, if your blood also isn't healthy, it can cause your hair to start to get thin uh, as well. Um, because you're not getting certain nutrients, the blood flow isn't good in your body. And so getting blood flow to different organ systems or even your hair affects its health. And so that's the thing. So if you're experiencing long COVID, you want to strengthen your blood and improve your, 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 the blood getting through your body. So here's a few things you can do. One, follow, consume a diet that's going to build your blood. That's going to be red meat. So grass fed beef, venison buffalo, lamb. So you want to get a lot of red meat in your diet. Um, you want to do things that help improve your blood viscosity. So wild caught fish, high in omega-3 fats like salmon are going to be helpful. You also want to do a lot of red and green foods. So beets are going to be fantastic. Um, doing a little bit of coffee is fine. You know, that's, it has that sort of reddish brown issue to it. That's going to be good. Cinnamon as an herb is really good. Uh, and then of course we mentioned grass fed beef. That's also right. And then lots of green foods. So spinach, um, it would be good. Broccoli, broccoli, rape, mustard greens. So you want to get a lot of red foods and a lot of green foods in your diet, especially a lot of green vegetables and a lot of red meat and a lot of omega-3 fat-rich foods. Those are going to help. And then you want to get a lot of good herbs in your diet. Um, turmeric is going to be one of the best. You could also take that as a supplement, but turmeric helps nourish and move the blood about 3,000 milligrams daily. Also, galangal or ginger with that. So I would do a mixture of do turmeric and do either galangal or ginger um, as well. And that's really going to help move the blood. I also as a supplement like beetroot juice powder. You can also do NAD uh, plus or NMN that also can help nourish the blood and cardiovascular health. And then, and then I would also do um, something like astragalus. That's really going to help strengthen the immune system and the lungs in a lot of these areas as well. And then I also think doing a cold plunge heat therapy where you're doing, it's called contrast therapy, where you either cold plunge or hot shower and you do hot, cold, hot, cold, doing that alternating back and back and forth helps with 
getting your blood moving and circulation to areas of your body. So I know I said quite a bit there, but in summary, if you have long COVID, I highly recommend you consume a diet that helps strengthen your blood and moves your blood, okay? So as I mentioned, um, you know, things like beets are wonderful. A lot of the red foods, a lot of the green foods, um, the contrast therapy, hot, cold. And by the way, I also like really like acupuncture for this. So I would see an acupuncturist. And those are some of the top tips. By the way, I'm going to do a whole episode on long, long COVID. So make sure you're subscribed here if you're not subscribed, because I'm going to go over exactly what to eat for every meal, supplement, and the root cause of that as well in a deeper way on this on an upcoming, uh, um, upcoming podcast. Um, why is my belly always so bloated? Do you have any tips to improve digestion and, it, and relieve abdominal bloating? Well, bloating tends to be caused by excess fermentation in the stomach. And sometimes what happens is almost all of your probiotics or just microbes, bacteria should be down in your colon um, or your large intestine. And what happens is sometimes some of that bacteria or candida or even E. coli can creep up into the small intestine or even sometimes stomach, and that can cause small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So think about that again. SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. That's part of the cause of bloating is you have bacteria that's, that's growing too much in either your small intestine or maybe even your stomach, but it tends to be small intestine. And then that's causing the bloating that you're experiencing. So here's what you can do for that. Um, one, reduce stress. When you're eating, don't be on your phone. Don't be looking at a screen. Don't be watching TV. Close your computer, sit there, and then eat your food and chew and just take some relaxing breath, S stop rushing around. That's tip number one. Number two, from a dietary standpoint, consuming foods that can easily move through your system. That's going to be things like meat, cooked vegetables, not raw. Those won't move through as quickly. So cooked meat, cooked vegetables, and maybe even rice, doing soups will tend to move through your system very easily and quickly, and they're well cooked. So don't do raw if you're bloated, do a lot of soups. Things like chicken vegetable soup, miso soup, um, that, that's, that, that's what you should really focus on doing. But meat, vegetables, rice, that is sort of the basis of your diet you do really well with. You can take some supplements and take an anti-bloating tea. I really like uh, a tea that has fennel, peppermint, uh, maybe cardamom in there as well, uh, ginger, chamomile. There's others. I mean, there, there's quite a few anti anti bloating herbs, but those are some of my favorites. So I would buy an anti bloating tea. And also another big thing I would do for bloating is take digestive enzymes and an SBO probiotic supplement. Those are probably the top two supplements, a soil based organism probiotic. You can just search online or go to Amazon or wherever and search SBO probiotic. And I like Ancient Nutrition as the brand for that. That's what I personally take. And then in addition to the that, I would take soy-based probiotics and then digestive enzymes. That's going to help bloating the most along with that herbal tea and along with eating the way that I mentioned. And going for walks around your meals, not laying down, but going for a short walk and moving around a little bit, all of those things will help your bloating tremendously. Next question, what other options are there for Tylenol and Advil that are natural. So here are some natural things you can do. Number one is turmeric. Turmeric contains curcumin, which by the way, in clinical studies has been shown to be more effective for many conditions than Tylenol and Advil. So turmeric and its active compound curcumin, especially when combined with black pepper, has really, really powerful anti-inflammatory properties. So that's gonna be number one is turmeric. Number two is going to be a proteolytic enzyme supplement. Now proteolytic enzymes like bromelain or natokinin that's actually different enzymes than, let's say, a digestive enzyme supplement that's going to have something like, you know, lipase and, um, and protease and other things that help break down those macronutrients. So, so that's going to be different. But yeah, a, a proteolytic enzyme supplement is going to be number two. After that, other anti-inflammatory herbs like ginger and rosemary and cat's claw also are going to be beneficial. Fish oil is also anti-inflammatory, so that's another good option there as well. CBD oil can oftentimes be beneficial. But if you want to know my top two, I would say the top two are going to be turmeric, 
and a proteolytic enzyme supplement. Next question, what, why are peanut allergies so common these days? When I was younger, there were only one or two kids in my whole school that had one, and now there are five in my daughter's class alone. Well, I think the reason has to do with uh, leaky gut syndrome. More and more kids today are exposed to uh, toxins and other things that help that start to affect kids' digestive health. And so I think it's all of the toxins and chemicals that we're exposed to on a regular basis. By the way, it's not only peanut allergies, it's just allergies as a whole. I think I was reading a study on kids and it said it used to be 2% of kids about 50 years ago had allergies. Today, it's at least four to 8%. And many, many actually physicians believe it's actually closer to 10%. So that's nearly a five times rise and increase in tree nut allergies and just allergies in general. So it definitely is way, way more prevalent, five times possibly more prevalent than when you were in school. All that being said, I think the big reason is, is there's more digestive issues today due to so much processed food, due to so much stress. And I do think there's a toxic burden on the body. There are many more toxins that kids are exposed to today. Uh, and it could also be via parents. Now, there's certain things I can't say on this pod, uh, you know, that, that, you know, I'll get censored for, which is crazy enough in terms of why there's so many peanut allergies today. But just go back to, I think it's toxins. Now, there are studies that show if a parent has an autoimmune disease, which is leaky gut, and then they're, they can pass some of these allergies or the, that immune response onto the kids. So sometimes the parent's health can affect the kid's health. But I also think antibiotic drugs, there's antibiotics in our food supply today. Sometimes kids are given antibiotics at a young age. I know, and there are studies that show that that can increase the risk of allergies if kids have used antibiotics at a young age. But I would say allergic exposures or being given anything that can affect the way the immune system responds, all of those things added up together increase allergies. I also think uh, chemicals in our food supply like Roundup ready foods in genetically modified organisms. I think, I think it's not one thing. I think there are many things that have accumulated that have caused this increase in allergies today. And I do think you can improve allergies as a symptom, by the way, I think acupuncture can help. I think that, uh, I think that taking certain herbs like astragalus and getting ginger and just bone broth and probiotics and all of those can reduce some of that damage and effect on the body over time. Next question, what causes parasites and how can I get rid of them naturally? Well, what causes parasites is you typically consuming something that has parasites in it. Now, here's the thing that might surprise you. We all have parasites in our body right now. We all have parasites. Now, obviously there's varying degrees. All of us have candida. All of us have cancer cells. All of us have things bad in our body. But here's the thing, if your body is strong and robust enough, your immune system is, your body just kills off pathogenic or organisms and unhealthy cells. Your body is killing off cancer cells. Your body is killing off viruses. Your body is killing off parasites or Lyme disease or whatever it might is. Your body naturally can keep these things at bay. This is actually just on a, just a little side note here. The biggest issue today of why a lot of medical doctors and even a lot of natural practitioners are ineffective in their ability to treat patients and help them get well is because they're trying to treat the parasite rather than trying to strengthen the human and allow the body to heal itself. Okay. There's a big difference between if you go into a medical doctor today and they say, oh, you have a parasite. Hey, we're going to give you an anti- anti-worm or even an antibiotic, which is crazy in some cases because it's so ineffective, but we're going to give you that or even a natural practitioner and you go in and you have parasites and they say, well, I'm going to give you um, wormwood or black walnut tincture, tincture or garlic. And I do think that should be part of a protocol, but doing that without strengthening the person's immune system, it, it typically won't fully resolve the symptoms uh, of, of a parasite. So biggest cause of parasites are typically traveling out of country or eating somewhere where you're getting parasites in your food. By the way, the greatest carrier of parasites by far of any meal you could eat would be if you consume pork. Pork pigs are, they, they carry parasites um, more than any other animal. 
This is the reason why even in, you know, if you read the, the Bible and, and there's still, you know, the Jews still follow kosher food laws in some Christians and then some Muslims as well, is that uh, God knew, hey, pigs and shellfish, they, they're, they're, they'll kind of eat anything, but they store toxins. And so this, the same goes here for parasites. If you want to get a parasite, eat a lot of pork. I mean, it's, it's going to be the most likely thing to give you a parasite. Or again, it, it, it also can be water as another, you, you can find a lot of parasites in certain, in, 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 in unclean water. So going back to what you can do about it, um, what I would do is starve it of sugar because parasites like a sort of damp, slimy environment. If you have candida or a lot of yeast or mucus in your body, you want to eliminate that. Best way to do that is eat more bitter foods. This is why if you ever taste the anti-parasitic herbs, black walnut and wormwood, wormwood tastes terrible. I mean, it is, it, it's, 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 it just ta- it's it's just terribly bitter. So if you would taste wormwood, you just you know your your face would just go into um, you know you you pucker in a really strong way. But those help clear out mucus and candida. So you want to consume things like that, garlic as well, that help oregano is another one that help cleanse your body of parasites. So you can take those. In addition, you want to strengthen your system, get rid of the sugar, consume a lot of organic organic meat from beef and chicken and salmon, no pork, and lots of vegetables. Uh, there's a few other things that are helpful with parasites. Doing pumpkin seeds can be very helpful. Papaya as a fruit or papaya seeds can also be helpful at fighting parasites. But I would say a lot of vegetables, some meat, um, some healthy fat, coconut oil is a good one, and, and olive oil that are anti-parasitic, and then pumpkin seeds, doing papaya. So I'd follow that diet for a while. You can also do a cleanse. Fasting can also be really good for parasites. And then just outside of that, getting outside, sunshine, vitamin D, that's going to be another thing that's really going to help in that way. Now, listen, you can do a week-long parasite cleanse, but in addition to that, you really want to follow a really clean diet for several months, along with getting more time outside and vitamin D. Next question here. I'm trying to lower my LDL naturally. Do you have any advice? Yeah, if you have high cholesterol, especially LDL, what I would recommend is is you follow more of a Mediterranean diet. Here are the top foods you should have. Wild-caught fish, olive oil, some healthy nuts and seeds. But it goes back to what I talk about constantly. Wild organic meat, like wild-caught fish is a big part of it. You know, grass-fed beef, chicken, eggs. That's, you know, that there's that group, lots of vegetables, loads of berries and fruit like figs, um, lots of olives and olive oil, and just eat that mostly, okay? And that will help lower LDL. Now, from a supplement standpoint, I would recommend turmeric. I'd recommend a fish oil supplement. Um, I'd recommend garlic. Those are probably the top three. So turmeric, garlic, fish oil um, would be what I would what I would take for that. Next question, what foods and nutrients support mental health conditions like anxiety, depression, and insomnia? Well, from a food standpoint, consuming more healthy fats will help with mental health and neurological health. So getting rid of the sugar and refined grains, doing more avocados, walnuts, coconut, wild-caught fish, certain types of nuts and seeds. I think I mentioned olives and olive oil, but you want to do a lot of those healthy fats in your diet. Some good lean protein, especially bone broth and wild caught fish, rich in omega-3 fatty acids. And that's really, that's really the basis of the diet. Uh, also, you want to get some B vitamins. Um, so you may take a B complex. Ginkgo biloba as an herb, I think is very good. Lion's mane mushroom is another good one. And to kind of also help with uh, neurological health, I think um, CBD oil, is another good one. So so that's what I would do. But let me see this. I think most mental health issues are related to something that's deeper in the soul and spirit. I think I would look at it more as a uh, a, an issue regarding identity or purpose. Okay. Who are you? Right. And I think a lot of these are spiritual struggles. And so if, if you're a person saying, well, I don't know who I am, 
That creates a lot of confusion. In fact, if you look at mental health issues, they've risen dramatically. And they've also risen with a lot of gender confusion with a lot of uh, young people. You look at Gen Z and the amount of people that identify on the LGBT uh, spectrum. We see that that correlation with mental health there's been a, a, a very similar increase in both of those. And what, what is some of that? Well, a lot of times people are wrestling with that age with their identity. And part of their identity is, well, what gender am I? Or what's my sexual preference? Or, and so there's a lot of confusion around that. When you're confused about those things, that'll cause mental health issues when you're confused about your identity and who you actually are. In order for you to have great mental health, you need to be correct in who you are. Do you hear me? It's not It's not like, well, I just pick one, so now I have good mental health. No, you need to be correct in who you actually believe to be. Let me give you an example of this, too, if you're incorrect. You could say, well, I believe that if I'm on a no-fat diet, I'm going to be healthier. Well, are you really going to be? No, because it's going to start causing nerve degeneration because your brain needs fat and other health issues versus if you say, well, I know that if I eat mostly organic meat and lots of vegetables and lots of berries, I'm going to be healthy, then you're right, right? So so if you're certain about your identity and knowing, hey, I'm a child of God and I, and I believe I'm going to live for eternity. I know I'm called to love people. I know this world's not about me. It's about God, but I am significant. I am important. I can add value to others, right? I, I'm my, my role as a spouse is incredibly meaningful. My role as a parent in raising up incredible children that, that, that are loving servants that want to benefit humanity and make earth a heavenly place. That's so meaningful. My, I know that my job and leader in my business or wherever you work, Hey, that's meaningful. So if you want to have good mental health, you need to have a strong identity and a strong identity means you know your role, where you should be, and you you attach a lot of meaning to it and you're able to operate in that role. So again, going back to this, when I know as a dad, like what it means to be a dad, and I'm fulfilling that role in a great way in terms of I'm teaching my daughter life lessons, I am disciplining her when she needs to be disciplined, I am loving her and hugging her and doing all those things with her when, you know, uh, on a regular basis, and I know that's meaningful, I got a strong identity, right? And the other thing is your purpose. What because my identity is this, because I'm a child of God and I'm a husband and I'm a father called to live for eternity, well, now my purpose is, well, that's tied into your gifts. And so why are you uniquely different than other people? Well, maybe you're a great writer or you're a great musician or you're just a, you're a great mom and homemaker and taking care of the family. So, so and, and you know, okay, this is my purpose. I'm called to be a great writer, okay? Well, then work on your writing and doing that thing you're really great at and getting better and better, and then use that for good in the world. That's your purpose or part of one of your multiple purposes. Boom. All of a sudden, anxiety disappears, depression disappears, insomnia gets better. When you're in touch with and knowing your true identity and you know your purpose and you're able to act in that purpose, those tend to go away. And I think there are also a lot of clinical studies that show that anxiety and depression tend to be when you think about yourself too much versus, no, I'm thinking about serving and meeting the needs of others. There, By the way, that's not just an opinion. Those are several studies, and I think that's biblical as well, both so spiritual truth and scientific truth of what actually cures anxiety and depression. I think it's your identity, knowing your purpose, and not reflecting on self, looking at benefiting the lives of others with your, through your identity and through your purpose, that more than the diet that I just shared with you will relieve anxiety, depression, insomnia, and mental health issues. Next question. How can I deal with hot flashes and menopausal symptoms naturally? So if you're having menopausal symptoms, what I, what one thing you want to do is you want to cut out sugar and refined grains. Okay. Anything that's going to cause blood sugar spikes and excess carbs. Again, that's number one. By far, I'm telling you, I've worked with a lot of women with menopausal issues, going lower carb, getting more protein, more fiber. What I talk about constantly, meat, vegetables, berries, okay? That's going to help. The other thing is going to be consuming certain herbs. Black cohosh tends to work very, very well, okay? Black cohosh, 
I like clary sage essential oil. So rubbing that on yourself or just having that in the air. But black cohosh is very effective. Um, I also, there, there, are there other herbs I think that can uh, be effective as well? Um, such as wild yam as, is another one that's frequently recommended there. Um, and I think those would probably be the top things I would say you can do. Now, I also think acupuncture as a treatment can help menopausal symptoms. Going on walks and just keeping stress low, um, active exercise, uh, being really active and in, in moving. Th those are those are going to be the top things. But listen, you are you probably are still going to have some level of menopausal symptoms. But I think if you follow what I just shared with you, you're going to see a pretty significant decrease in those symptoms. Next question, what hormone imbalances could be causing low libido and how can I restore optimal levels? You know, I think low libido more than anything is tied to cortisol. Now, I also think there's a level of insulin. So if you're having a lot of blood sugar issues, I think that's tied to it. But then there's also imbalanced levels of dopamine and oxytocin that I think can also be connected there. So let me go through some of these individually. So one is we're talking about cortisol. You know, that that has to do with your your body not being in in, in tune with circadian rhythms, okay? And you get being in too high of a stress state. If you can get outside early in the morning and start seeing, uh, getting out in the natural sunlight for about 15 to 20 minutes, that starts to re, uh, set your, your circadian clocks. That's going to help. And then also at night, not looking at all the blue light, that starts to throw off those cortisol levels. And so listening to a, an audio book or wearing blue blocker sunglasses while you watch TV and ideally a shorter amount of time at night, and then doing things just to sort of calm your body and strengthen your soul, reading spiritual growth books, like a book like um, Captivating or Born for Significance. Those are a couple, there's a bunch of great ones. But I think those sort of books that nur nourish your soul are going to be very, very beneficial at strengthening your libido. Now, from the level of oxytocin, that's about connection. And so I think, and that happens with physical touch, but I think it also happens when you have a, a, an, a spiritual and emotional con connection with somebody outside of that. So I think with your spouse, setting up date nights or date days, or just times where you guys are just doing things, it's not out of busyness, it's out of, hey, we're, we are doing something in order to connect with one another. And so I would say that that's important as well as scheduling just time together, trips and getaways and letting your partner know, communicating, hey, you know what? I uh, I don't feel connected and I want to feel connected to you. I don't think your partner is going to be offended, whether, whether you're a, a woman asking about your husband or a husband acting about your wife. I don't think that, I don't think that, um, they're going to be offended if you sit down with them and say, hey, listen, I uh, I just don't feel connected to you and I want to. I feel like earlier in marriage we did and I feel like now we just don't have that same connection. And so I think letting them know that and doing things and figuring out, okay, how do we create greater connection? I think that helps libido as well. Now, sometimes is that going back to the cortisol, adrenal, if your adrenal battery gets low, it's also gonna cause low libido. So some things that can help that include um, ashwagandha as an herb, so adaptogenic herbs, ashwagandha, cordyceps have been shown to help with this, ginseng for women, uh, ginseng for men, dong kwai for women, um, maca root for women. So I think that you can take start taking some adaptogens as well, exercise, physical exercise, especially weightlifting. Um, it, or, or interval like training that, that can help libido some as well. Not more than cardio, cardio, too much cardio can start to lower libido weightlifting or strength training actually can, it will typically increase libido, um, over time. But I would say those are some of the top things you can do to start strengthening and improving your, your, your libido, but having really connection with your partner where you're doing things together, working out together. There's, there's a good one. Reading a spiritual growth book together, praying together, doing those things together will help help both people increase libido. Last question. My husband was just diagnosed with dementia. Are there any natural remedies that can help? Yes, a ketogenic diet is very good for dementia, especially if it's high in healthy fats like coconut oil. So a healthy keto diet, you get you're, you're eating moderate protein, high fat, low carb, taking supplements like fish oil, doing a lot of coconut oil, as I mentioned, um, also doing things that help, um, you know, I, 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 there really aren't a lot of supplements. I, I would do fish oil, 
primarily, and then I would do turmeric, and I would do ginkgo biloba, and I would do lion's mane mushroom. Those are the primary supplements, but I think doing more of that high fat, moderate protein, low carb diet is going to help dementia uh, more than anything. So that's what I would recommend for that. By the way, hey, if you have other questions, hey, ask in the comment section if you're watching on YouTube, and I'll jump in there and answer some of your questions or do my best to, or try and cover it possibly in a future Q&A session as well. And by the way, if you are not subscribed here to the podcast, hey, please subscribe. And if you heard something you believe is going to benefit someone else, hey, please share this podcast episode with them as I'm always looking to help transform the lives of people. And thanks so much for being on mission with me. And thanks so much for tuning in to the podcast this week. Listen, if you like this video, go click here and check out my video on seven easy health habits that will make you live a lot longer. I think you're going to really love this episode. Thanks for watching.